Hello and welcome to another episode of Pivotal Moments. First of all, I am so excited for a new season. So many exciting things to share, so many amazing stories. Today, we have a very special Pivotal Moments. I am here today with a good friend of mine who is not only gonna be talking about her pivotal moment, but really is going to be using this conversation to start many more conversa conversations of sharing her voice. Um, we know it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month and Tammy is going to be sharing her journey, her story, dealing with domestic violence and how it tragically ended. It's gonna be very, very, very special. So without any more introduction, let me welcome Tammy to Pivotal Moments. Thank you, Lita. It's an honor to be here today. So of course, this is Pivotal Moments. We always talk about a person's pivotal moment, but let's actually go back and talk about what led to the pivotal moment that you're gonna share. Grew up in a middle-class family, a total of six folks, went off to college, you know, the whole thing, go to college, get a good job, get married, have the family. And uh, my, between my first and second years of college, I met my husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very interesting courtship. I was in a strange place in my life at that point. Um, my first year of college hadn't gone quite the way I intended for it to go. And I was feeling a little bad about myself. And there were some challenges going on at home. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling kind of displaced and feeling like, what's my purpose? And he came along and he gave me a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, he was present in a way that my family wasn't. And he fed me, you know, and at that point I was working, but food was hard to come by and I was struggling on multiple levels. And it seemed like he had swooped in and was willing to help meet all of my needs at that point, wow. you know. Wow. So we ended up dating and I went away for a while. This is in Baltimore. Okay. And I then made the decision to leave the area and go stay with some family in New York and broke up came back down about a year later, we reconnected, and we got married shortly thereafter. Mm. So, uh, never was in this place where I felt like I was in love with him, but I felt like this might be my only chance. Mm. Because I had somehow convinced myself through all the things that had happened up to that point, and we might get into that a little bit later, mm -hmm. that nobody else would want me. Mm -hmm. And so here this person is giving me attention, and he's willing to take care of me, and tells me that I'm smart, and I'm beautiful, and I'm capable. And I needed that so desperately. Mm. And so uh, we got married, we had our first child, and then we had our second child. But it was a very bizarre relationship. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that part of it? Mm -hmm. Because I know when we talked about it beforehand, uh, and we were just talking about you know abuse and, and toxic relationships, mm -hmm. and people tend to have one viewpoint of what they think it looks like. Mm -hmm. And that can be harmful when you're in it because you even can feel like, well, this doesn't look like what abuse or, you know, violent relationships. Mm -hmm. So talk about what it was like. Were, were you feeling, you mentioned bizarre, were you yes. feeling like something's very wrong here? Like talk yes. about that. So during the courtship portion, um, I remember, that I was working full time. And so sometimes my bosses would keep me a few minutes late. Mm -hmm. So my husband would come pick me up at five o'clock and I might call him and say, hey, I'm gonna be up five minutes late. They needed me to do an extra set of papers or whatever. And I would come down, he wouldn't speak to me. Mm. And so two days, three days might go past and he wouldn't talk to me because I was five minutes late getting off of work. And I'm like, this doesn't feel like it's supposed to feel, but, I, and I, I felt terrible, but I didn't recognize that at the time for what it was. Mm -hmm. And that would happen in different places. I would, silent treatment was one of his, his most, his go-tos for how he would let me know that I had displeased him in some way. Mm -hmm. And then after, you know, he felt I'd been punished enough, he'd start talking again as if nothing had happened, mm -hmm. um, which was very disorienting. Um, one of the other things that happened was that he was constantly checking on me to see where I was. I'd get phone calls all the time or text messages, and I'm thinking, well, he's being attentive. It's a lot, but he's being attentive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was, where are you? Who are you with? You know, but it was trying to couch in kind of a friendly way, but you still felt like those were the questions that were being answered, mm -hmm. um, being asked. And I would answer them, 
and it just felt weird, but he's giving me attention. I need attention, right? So that was one thing. And then one of the things that really got me was I was a member of the Morgan State University Choir. Mm. And I was in the singers group, and this was back in the days of Dr. Carter, who was mm. a phenomenal man. Yeah. Um, and I was uh, one of the young ladies in the group started a separate band outside and she invited me to come wow. and sing with them. Wow. I was so excited. Yeah. And um, my husband said to me, you can't go. Mm. And he said, I, I don't want you to be in a recording studio with a bunch of guys. And he said that and cut that short, but then it began to be, I don't want you hugging people when you're in the choir. Now you know how it is when you're in a choir, mm -hmm. and most of these people are church folk, we hug each mm -hmm, other. It's mm -hmm. a way of showing love. Yeah, yeah. And it's a way that we have camaraderie. And he's like, no, I don't want them feeling what I feel. Wow. And so I said, it, it felt strange yeah, again, but yeah. it, it registered as odd, but it didn't register as, ooh, this is way to the, so I didn't go to the group. The group then became a famous group. I gave the name. Most of your people would know who they were. Wow. Um, wow. And I, you know, to this day, I regret not telling him, you know, you can kick rocks. Yeah. You yeah. Know? But it was smaller and smaller circles that he was putting me in. And then came a point where he said to me, um, you can't have friends outside of our relationship. Wow. You can only be friends with couples that I approve of. Wow. And no single friends. Wow. And again, I was so desperate to have somebody love me yep. that I agreed to it, mm. you know? And so it was things like this that let me know something was really, really wrong. But because I had grown up in a household of abuse, mm. I didn't realize that I had already been primed to accept this kind of treatment. Mm. That's it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I talked to my mother about some things, but I didn't tell her the full breadth of it because at the same time that I was going through this with my husband, she was being abused by her spouse. So she wasn't in a position to say anything. So it was generational. And so I'm struggling. I, at this point, I have a small child and I'm like, I'll, I'll just be the best mother I can. I'll be the best wife I can. Maybe if I cook the right meals for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I get to clean, I keep the house as clean as possible and, and I, I show that I'm really, you know, obedient, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. he'll, he'll know that he can trust me and he can give me the freedom. Um, so, but it didn't change things, mm -hmm. you know. And over time, you know, the circles were tight enough, no, we're not gonna go see family, you know. And if I managed to get permission to go see my family for a holiday, I was always alone, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't pleased that I made the decision. So it, it made things small. Um, I wanted to go back to college. When he met me, I was a freshman at Hopkins, and I took time off, wanted to go back, and he had said to me, no, you don't get to go back to college. You'll wait, you know. I want to start a real estate investment, so when we get that off the ground, then you can go back to school. Wow. And that never happens. Wow. You know, so it was all these things, and I recognized something's wrong. This is wrong, this feels bad, but I never said, it was abuse, yeah. never. Um, and so it escalated over time. Um, and then there was a point when I had our second child when he had, I don't know what had happened, it was almost something flipped in his brain and the circles were getting smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter, more and more control. And um, he came home one day and he said, at this point my oldest daughter's almost three mm -hmm. and um, I'm pregnant with the youngest one. And he says to me, I want you to leave. You leave the three-year-old here, and you go wherever you need to go. But when I come back, I want you out of the house. Wow. I was pregnant with the youngest. He was an over-the-road truck driver. So none of this made sense to me. Mm. And I remember thinking, okay, maybe he's having some sort of a psychotic break. Mm. or he's high. He'd never been one to use drugs or alcohol either. He was completely clean on that, so that wasn't an issue, but I didn't know what to do. I definitely wasn't leaving a three-year-old alone in the house. Yeah. And so um, I stayed with some, I left the house, I stayed with some family, uh, because when I asked him about it, just to clarify, I said, you're telling me this, it doesn't make sense. And he said, I said what I said. Mm. And I will hurt or kill anyone who doesn't adhere to what I said. Wow. Wow. So I left. 
I took the baby, the young one, and we went away for a couple days. I went to court to uh, get a restraining order. And the judges at that time, this is in 19, now this is around 2000, okay. and they said, well, you clearly have some issues in your marriage, but it doesn't rise to a level where we feel that your husband needs to have any kind of a temporary restraining order placed on you. So I went back to the house to pick up some clothes because I knew I still didn't feel safe. And two men followed me. So I drove to the house and I saw them out the side of my eye in a truck in front of the house where nobody was moving. And I watched them watch me. And I backed my car out. Because you learn after a while, even if you haven't identified it as mm -hmm, abuse, mm -hmm, you learn mm -hmm. to have, okay, I always mm -hmm. fill my gas tank. I always mm -hmm. have at least $20 in my pocket. Mm -hmm, I always mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. And I watched, I backed out, I started moving. And they moved with me. I went down the street and they followed me. I made a left turn, they made a left turn. That was it. And I fled. I fled. Wow. So, yeah. When wow. I and just to, I mean, first of all, just the fact that you're sharing this is just, it, it takes so much courage, you know? And, and as a person who lived in, in an abusive relationship, um, I know that, you know, we can sometimes tell the story, but it, it still just really can't even capture what it was like living in it. And I think it's so important that you're sharing the, your story because people need to understand, especially when it comes to intimate partner abuse and relationships that it's not always necessarily what you might see on TV, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, you know, oh, you didn't cook this right and popping you, you know, punching you. Mm -hmm. That's not always necessarily what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you felt like something was wrong, but you couldn't identify it as abuse. Yeah. And I think that's something for those watching, definitely pay attention to when you feel like that gut check, right? When you feel like something Trust is it. wrong, you have to trust it and listen to it, right? And of course, we don't know. We don't know in the moment to, to pay attention to it yeah. because we just don't know. Wow. Okay, so mm -hmm. you fled. Yep. But we know that the story doesn't end there. Right. Um, I came back. You came back as many women As many do. of us do. Yes. I knew it was wrong. I knew something was off. And But what I said was, you know, I don't want to live afraid. So I had a moment of bravery stupidity mm -hmm. um and i came back and he was moving his girlfriend into our house and he had sold all of my belongings mm -hmm. wow. and so she came down the stairs and she confronted me about breaking up the household and he came downstairs and he was all upset you know and he was contrite and i'm gonna keep trying to kill himself wow. you know it was all of this stuff um, so i come home and, and he's like you know, i'm gonna kill myself i'm so upset and all of this and, and we we made up for a while mm -hmm. she moved out and I had the second child and we played house for a while like it was all nice and we love each other and it's great and then when the, the second baby was born it came out that you know I was just going through the motions right because that's what I'm gonna do is you know, but I you're a, he would tell me you are a terrible wife and you're a horrible mother and that would come out in different ways at different times. It's like, we're gonna drip a little bit of acid here and there to make you question what you're doing, how well you're doing your own value. And I've heard that from other women who are not being beaten up by their partners yep. externally, yes. but they're being beaten down internally. Yes. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. And so we stayed, and my sister came to stay with us that summer. So I had a C-section and I needed some help. So my sister was 13 at the time. Okay. Came down and said, like, yay, sister time. Yeah. And she's like the auntie. So she had the little three-year-old and she had the infant and she was in her glory, yeah. you know? Yeah. And she stayed for about a month. And um, my mother and I were about four and a half hours apart. So we would meet in the middle to mm -hmm. do a handoff. Mm -hmm. And on my way back from taking my sister back from where we were in Baltimore, halfway to where my mother was in Binghamton, um, my sister told me that my husband had molested her. Oh my goodness. And oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So I'm like, my sister, who was 13, who was like the light of my life, and we had 14 years between us, but we were close. And this is my husband, who 
something's not quite right with him, but I hadn't pegged him as a pedophile. Right, right. You know, and yeah. this is what she tells me. And we didn't lie to each other. Mm. We never lied. So I believed her. Yeah. And because I was a survivor of having been molested multiple times as a young person, I knew you have to tell mommy. Yeah. Because you'll carry it and you'll feel bad about yourself the rest of your life. You'll feel like you're responsible. You did nothing wrong. But I shouldn't have been with him, she said. I shouldn't have been down in the basement when you were in bed. I said, honey, he's a 30-year-old man. You could have tap danced naked on a table in front of him. His appropriate response would have been, little girl, go put your clothes on and go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. You did nothing wrong. I said, but your marriage is over. I said, it was over before. Mm. You didn't do this. Wow. So she told my mom. My mom pressed charges, mm. and my husband went through all kinds of changes. So in my house, I'm thinking, okay, my sister was molested by my husband. My husband has a history of really odd behavior towards me. If I can keep everybody calm, nobody will get hurt. We'll go through the process. His attorney said he'll probably end up just having to do some community service. He'll be on a list of pedophiles, but it just isn't community service. Mm -hmm. It feels worse than it is. Wow. So we lived like that for about nine months where we're waiting for the trial, waiting for the trial, waiting for the trial, and he's uncomfortable, and he's like, whose side are you on? I said, mm. honey, I, I'm not even getting this conversation. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll just keep him calm, yeah. keep him happy. Well, yeah. 10 days before the trial, he and a friend of his drove from Baltimore, Maryland, to Binghamton, and made the decision to execute my mother and my sister. So, there's no way to express what that felt like. You know, it's everything that had gone on before did not culminate in a double murder. And then he came back and I had no idea what happened the night it happened. So they were killed on a Saturday, July 20th. He came back that following morning, 5.01 a.m. And he pulled a gun on me because the police were outside. And I'm like, why are the police? And I'm, the infant's in the crib, my other daughter's with her, her grandparents, no idea. And he said, get down. And he had the gun trained on me. Oh my goodness. And I said, okay. And I wasn't shocked. Right. I remember this bizarre feeling of, okay, this is bizarre, but it's within the, the realm of all the behavior that yes. I've been experiencing. You know, in hindsight, it's the whole frog in the water thing, right? Mm -hmm. You just become more accustomed, more comfortable with increasing degrees mm -hmm. of mistreatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and you rationalize it. Um, and eventually the police went away. He put the gun down and went through this bizarre confessional thing, and our lives were completely changed at that point. Wow. You know, they took him into custody two hours later. They took me into custody for questioning for 14 hours. And mm -hmm. then we had to leave because he technically was not fully arrested, whatever that means, right? Wow. He was arrested, he was being held, but they couldn't officially hold him for too long, for three days. He had an accomplice, and what he always told me was, I have friends and I can call in favors. So I knew if he was able to get one person to go with him to murder my mother and my sister, there were other people waiting in the wings if I didn't adhere to whatever behavior he thought I should adhere to. So I, Remember the morning that uh, when I went in that Sunday morning to the police station and I had my infant and the police had taken me in from the house. I'm like, are you Mrs. Parker? And I said, yes, I am. I said, is your husband home? I said, yes, he's in the basement. We were living in separate parts of our town at that point. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to go in and talk with him, but we need to take you with us. I'm like, I have a modeling gig today. I don't have time. Like, you're going to have to come with us. Again, knowing nothing. So I get to the police station and the police said to me, um, Mrs. Parker, we were correct to inform you that your mother and your sister were found executed in their basement last night. And for a moment, like the world literally just stopped. Mm. It just stopped. And then I couldn't stop screaming. Mm. I just, I had my baby, I could not stop screaming. 
dreaming. And I don't know how long that lasted. And then when I was done, everything shut down. I went into business mode. I called all my family members. I let them know what happened. I said, you know, so-and-so, I won't say his name here. He, you know, he killed mommy and Devin. He killed mommy and Devin. We're here in Baltimore. This is what happened. We went to a woman's shelter. I got my, my three-year-old from my grandparent, from her grandparents, and we were in the shelter for a couple weeks. And then we were moving around from family to family because now we're homeless. Yeah. You know, I couldn't go back. And so it was a very strange journey because I wasn't sad. I wasn't grieving. I was in shock. Yes. I was in shock. Yeah. Um, and I took complete responsibility because A, you know, I married this guy. I made the decision. He had access. B, I invited him down to see my sister, right? He was with us. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have had opportunity to harm her if she hadn't been there. C, I probably wasn't the good enough wife to keep him from making that kind of decision. I could have done something different, maybe made his favorite foods more often or whatever, and it would have, it would have been okay for him to say, you know, I'm really upset about this, but nothing. Um, I was just in shock. I, I, and my family, unfortunately, a lot of the family members on my mother's side of the family held me personally responsible, and they made sure to let me know that. Wow. So, you know, there was this, you know, there was this layering of shame and guilt for something that started off as, I don't know what's happening, to the worst possible thing has happened, and nobody knows how to respond. So there's a lot that went on there, but ultimately, you know, we bounced around. There was a cousin of mine on my mother's side of the family who was just a love, and she took us in, and uh, we lived on campus with her and her husband, who was RA at the time at a college. But we were deemed a safety risk because of my husband's gang affiliations, so we had to leave. And it was like, so now I can't even be safe with my children. We've gone through all of this. And we needed somewhere to rest, and we, we needed respite. We were homeless at this point. Mm. Um, and we finally, after bouncing around family member to friend, family member to friend, settled on one spot in Syracuse, New York, where a cousin of mine, who I hadn't spoken to in years, but who was just in love, said, I'm not in my house right now. I'm in the hospital fighting cancer, but you can be in my house. Mm. And we went there and we stayed and she passed in October, but her daughter, who was a good friend of mine who I'd gone to stay with when I fled from my husband a couple years earlier, said, you and your daughter's team as long as you need to. Wow. So we had respite and we had angels, you know, yes. along the journey. Yeah. Um, so, I, I don't, I don't know how to talk about that point. I mean, there were so many things that, places where I wish I had had an intervention before, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I was like, girl, don't you know if a man tells you that you can't be seeing anybody else, that you, there's something wrong with him, leave him, you know? Right. Didn't right. have that. It right. was like, no, you're supposed to be a good girl and you stay with him and, and that's it. And if you have sex, then that means you've committed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that there's, there's the shame and there's the guilt and I grew up in purity culture, right? Yeah. And so yeah. all of that plays into it. And I didn't want my children to grow up without a father, mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah. we tell ourselves all these reasons why this decision, though it feels bad for us, is actually a good choice ultimately given the alternatives yeah and it hardly ever turns out okay wow you know wow. and so um after that happened there were about four months from the period of their deaths to where i just was not even a human being mm. you know i describe it like everything around me looked like it was i was on a train set you know, the little yeah, toys where yeah. everything is plastic mm. and you're just going through this artificial landscape, but nothing, you couldn't feel anything. Yeah, yeah. I didn't cry. Yeah. I didn't sleep. Uh, I, I just, I felt like a shell. Yeah. You know? yeah. But not sad, just, just empty. Empty yeah. and, and not. There was nothing there. Um, and I remember in that experience. So I have a place to stay. I have no money, I have no car, because my car was somewhere else. We had to keep things kind of separate because we weren't sure who was gonna tag me. Mm. Um, I couldn't remember how to wash dishes. Wow. Like, and I was, the whole time people, some people are gonna say, honey, you've been traumatized. Mm. This is trauma, you have trauma. And I'm like, no, 
I'm not the one who's in the ground. Mm. So don't put that on me because that implies that I'm a victim and a victim implies that there's innocence mm. and I am responsible for this. Mm. Wow. So no, I don't get to claim victim. Thank you very much. And I push people away. Um, but I could not function right. I would, I'd get my kids to daycare because I knew to do that once we got yeah. established, daycare, because they have to have a good start. And I would lay on the floor for hours. Mm. You know, just not thinking, not moving, just laying there. Oh. Um, and I couldn't do basic things. We went, we ate, we should have gotten stock in Old Country Buffet. <laughs> You know, because yeah, I, I get a balanced meal. You know, you got your right. meats and your veggies and your this and that. Yeah. And um, but I, I couldn't. And I'm a good cook. Yeah. But I cooking wasn't happening, and I couldn't remember how to wash dishes. And I distinctly remember one day in that four initial four month period where I'm looking at the dishes and I'm looking at the soap and I'm looking at the water and I'm looking at the sponge and I'm like, this all comes together somehow. And the dishes move from this side of the sink to the other side of the sink. And they go from being covered in food to being sparkly. How does that work? Wow. And I, you know, again, it's trauma, yeah. but you don't claim that. And when you don't claim it, you won't reach out for help. Yeah. When you can't acknowledge what's been done to you mm. and that it's been done to you, not that you did it yourself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you won't seek the resources that can get pull you out and you won't allow yourself the support that is available to you. Wow. So, um, yeah, so that was kind of how things were going. And, you know, I was on the bathroom floor one time and this kind of gets into what led to the change yeah, after yeah, all of that. Yeah, yeah. And before you, you talk about the pivotal mm -hmm. moment, let's just take a pause because you just walked us through a journey that is just, it's unbelievable. You know, it's painful. And it's like to just be sitting here talking to you and 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 hearing what you went through. I mean, my heart just goes out to you. And I just, you know, I commend you for even being willing to talk about it and to share your story. And, and as we said, this is gonna start you doing more of it, mm -hmm. of really getting out there and trying to help other women by your story. But I just wanted to pause and just say, first of all, I'm very sorry for your loss. I am very, very sorry that you just had to endure all of that. But I am just so proud of you for being here today and talking about it. Yes. So now the pivotal moment, yes. right? Yes. So we got to the point, you are traumatized, you're just functioning barely, mm -hmm. and you have a pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. So what, let's talk about that. So I've shared with you all how I spent a lot of time on the floor. The floor and I got very well acquainted. Yes. <laughs> so the floor of the kitchen, the floor of the living room, yes. uh, the floor on the back porch. Yes. And so the floor of the bathroom and I decided we had an appointment. Okay. You know, I did manage to keep myself fairly clean. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I would get out of the shower and then I'd just plop down and then I would just kind of lay down and, and that's just where I would be. Wow. And there was one day when I was on the floor, not moving, not thinking, not feeling, just there. And my girls were at daycare and I remember it was like this voice came to me. It was as clear as if it was audible, but it was something in my spirit. And mm -hmm. it said to me, if you've survived the nightmare, then you have a mandate to manifest the dream. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was God. Though he and I have been tussling. <laughs> you know, yes, we have yes. been tussling because I've been a Christian since I was nine and I just knew God takes care of us and he looks out for us and he protects his children and when the enemy comes in one way, God sends him out seven and no weapon formed again. I'm like, that is not working here. Yeah. Do you see what just happened? Yeah. So I was angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was I was not trusting. I'm like, God, I don't know who you are anymore. Yeah. And I damn sure don't trust you. Yeah, yeah. So I no longer took comfort in the faith of my youth. Mm. 
But I knew I couldn't completely disconnect. And so in that moment, when I heard that, if you've survived the nightmare, you have a mandate to manifest a dream, something clicked. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I got up off the floor. I applied an ollient. I washed my face. Yeah. I put on clothes. And I just carried that. And it mm. changed the way that I was viewing where I was going to go from here. Mm because I was maintaining, you know, I said, my babies need to be educated, put them in a really good preschool. Um, they need to be fed. Old Country Buffet offers a variety of delicious <laughs> <laughs> foods from all four food groups. <laughs> you get it where you can. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, and, and I did that, but then I gradually like began to, I guess, unthaw. Yeah. And one of the first things I did was allow myself to get a therapist, mm. you know, because I said, people keep throwing this T word around. Yeah. Like, I, I have this thing called t trauma. Yeah. Maybe I should see somebody who might know a little bit more about it than me. Mm. And when I went, it was a beautiful experience because this man had so much compassion for me. He was like a big golden bear with all this love and he knew God mm -hmm. but he wasn't going to push religion on me mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. he said okay I want to meet you where you are and through the year that we had the relationship he was able to help me understand that what had happened the precipitating event that led me there was traumatic and horrific and one of the worst things he'd ever heard of himself yeah yeah so he acknowledged what I had experienced yeah. and he legitimized like I wasn't crazy for but then he said everything that else had happened in your marriage that was an aberration of what love is mm. okay and you will go through successful iterations of understanding what happened to you and you'll be able to unpack that you're going to go through anger and grief over losing your mother and your sister. You're going to go through anger and grief over allowing yourself to be in there. And you'll go through all these different phases of things that you're going to be able to unpack, unwrap, and come to terms with. But the last thing that you're going to do is come to terms with how you lost yourself. Mm. And I'll tell you, that's still a process. Mm, um, of course. But it was amazing. And I... I'm so grateful because it allowed me to get out of this idea that I I was not deserving of support. Yeah. I was not deserving of love, which was a central thing that I had carried from the time I was six. Wow. You know? Yeah. And it's, 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 you can slice what happened to me, both with the selection of my marriage partner, what I allowed, um, 12 different ways in terms of what informs it, you know? So many of us have been abused as children. Mm -hmm. We have been neglected in different ways. We have um, had an absence of connection. And that we've internalized in our young minds as I'm not worthy. Yeah. You know, I don't deserve love. I don't deserve to be understood. I don't deserve happiness. Yeah. You know, I can perform if I perform and people applaud me, that's great. Mm -hmm. But they don't really know, mm -hmm. you know, who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to I've got to hide behind these. We do all these things to ourselves. Yeah. And it's been this continual unveiling of that. But now, you know, I'm at a place where I don't have to hide anymore. Yeah. You know, and I still go through changes. There, I, you know, manifesting the dream, you pivot, but then there's a process. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, all right, I'm on public assistance right now because I can't work. I could not work. Yeah. Remember the dishes? Yeah. And um, I could not get through a day. You know, mm -hmm. thinking and doing things. Eventually, I was able to work. Yeah. Eventually, I was able to go back to church. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first I walked into my church. Uh, this is about seven months after the murders, and I felt a peace I could not explain. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because God and I were cool then, right? Because <laughs> we were still tussling. <laughs> 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 And the book says this. <laughs> this is outside the book. Yeah. But I went in and I felt a peace. And mm. my pastor in this church in Syracuse, um, it was it was so healing. They just they took me in, mm. and I remember just soaking in all of this teaching about who we are in God and how much He loves us. 
and how his plan for us is for us to continue to grow and to continue to thrive and to prosper. And I can listen to the things about, you know, build a good life and, yeah, yeah. and be a person who can, who can increase your market value and your worth to society. Yeah. Like, go, perform, perform. <laughs> right, right. But I will tell you one time he preached about how God loves us unconditionally. Mm. Irrespective of what we've done, what we failed to do, how we failed, you know, and I literally ran out of the sanctuary. Wow. I wasn't ready. Yeah. You know. And every time it would come up, I said, yeah, but you killed your mother and your sister. Mm. And that, there was a conflation in there mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And over time, you know, God was able to wear down on that. And he would bring people into my life to help me understand. Mm. You know. So the wow. pivotal moment came on the bathroom floor. And then there was progression. There was saying, okay, if, if this is me and I have a mandate to manifest the dream, the dream doesn't look like public assistance. Right. The dream doesn't look like you can't manage your budget. The dream doesn't look like you're alone. The dream doesn't look like you're just getting by. Mm. The dream looks like rich friendships. Mm. You know, the dream looks like taking your gifts and sharing them with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it looks like having fun with your children and enjoying that experience of being a mother, even though your heart is broken. Yes. You know. Yes. And so I began to do things that moved me in that direction. You know, and <laughs> wow. oh my goodness, I it's love it, it is, this is so great. And as we kind of begin the wrap up portion of this amazing, powerful conversation, um, we started off by saying that this is the beginning for you. So let's talk about what's next in this journey of manifesting the dream mm -hmm. and how we as a community can help and I know you and I are going to be doing a lot more Absolutely. together yes. um, and just helping to reach women but what is next for Tammy? Okay so one of the things that I'm working on is putting out some kind of publication mm -hmm. and I haven't decided if it will be a booklet yeah. or a full book but one of the things that I realized is as much as we hear about domestic violence awareness there still are a lot of pockets of misinformation, right? Yes. Like, like with my story, I didn't know I was being abused. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was in the woman's shelter after the murders where a woman sat down and showed me the wheel of abuse. Yes. Oh, financial. That's why I couldn't go to college because I would outstrip him. And then psychological. Oh, and then familial and relational. And, yes. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I want to demystify mm -hmm. what that looks like, mm -hmm. right? So being able to have something where people can read, tell my story in vignettes where yeah. I can get deeper. I know I kind of went off in a couple of trails here, but there's a lot more substance to each of the yeah. each of the moments that went on in my yeah. life. Um, and have vignettes where I can explain what was going on internally, mm. what informed the decision I made, what I could have done differently. Because I think about young girls, uh, I think about young women that maybe haven't had an experience with a relationship, being able to recognize themselves mm -hmm. and stop before they get to a place where it's too too late to turn back. Yeah. So I want to tell that story. Um, I enjoy being around people in small circles. Yes. So, you know, having groups, I mean, obviously with COVID, we have some limitations, but I want to be able to do that, to get yeah. together. And, all right, let's talk. You know, are we going to talk today? What is love? Yes. And what is it supposed to feel like? Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't have to question if your partner loves you. And this cuts across. It's not just heterosexual relationships. Yeah. Same-sex relationships have the same kinds of things going on. Yeah. And so we need to define love. We need to understand um, who we are. You know, yeah. if we don't know our own value, we will settle for things that are far beneath what God has purposed for us. You know, so wow. I want women to understand that. And men, too. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think about is I'm so glad that we have these conversations now. And I think a lot of women are awakening. What I have found is we're finding so many men that have been in abuse, mm -hmm. situ abusive situations. And so just in general, we need to know what our birthright is as mm -hmm. children of God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Y'all, listen, listen. <laughs> when I say we will be doing some more things together because I love it. I'm, Timmy, I've always enjoyed talking to Likewise. you. Likewise. Uh, like I said, of course, had no idea of any of this part of your journey, but you've always just been someone so positive and encouraging and strong. And I just, 
I just love you to pieces. Right? <laughs> I will tell you, God is real. Even when I wasn't sure who it was, I knew God was real. Yes. And yes. so everything in there, that everything that I've been able to do, whatever strength I have, I say because God is real. Yes. And there's a place where you get to. One of the things about pivoting for me was, if I'm here, I better give purpose to my family. Mm. And part of that purpose is going to others and, and being willing to be vulnerable yes. and let people ask me difficult questions yes. so that they don't have to experience that. Yes. You know? Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you again for coming to Pivotal Moments, sharing your story. Um, I'm sure as you all watch this, you're going to want to hear more from Tammy. <laughs> um, I have my information up mm -hmm. there. And then, Tammy, you can let I me know what you want to share. Well. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, we will be seeing more of, of Tammy. And once again, thank you for your bravery, your courage, telling your story. And I just can't wait to see what this next part of your journey is going to be. You and me both. Yes, I love <laughs> it. And you. as always, thank you all for tuning in supporting pivotal moments and and just sharing in journeys just like this um i appreciate you of course shout out to jirani coffee house for yes. allowing us to do this very important pivotal moments here at jirani coffee house definitely check jirani coffee house out um but yeah thanks again for tuning in and we will see you next time on pivotal moments with lilita